Because this is Washington, D.C., uh, we don't want to, we have many opportunities here, and one of them has just presented ourselves with um, His Excellency Ambassador Farid Yassin, who is Iraq's ambassador to the United States. Um, he has just come in, but he has to leave to catch a plane, and so he is going to speak uh, briefly, um, and I'm going to introduce him. He became ambassador to the United States in November 2016. He's educated in Iraq, Switzerland, and the United States. And Dr. Yassin was initially trained as a physicist and carried out research at leading universities in Europe and the United States before getting involved in political activism and human rights advocacy. He joined Iraq's Ministry of Foreign Affairs in July 2004 and has previously served as head of the ministry's Department of Policy Planning as diplomatic advisor to Deputy President Adil Adil Abdel Mahdi, and prior to his posting to Washington, he was uh, Iraq's ambassador to France. I am an academic, but I'm a scientist, and, so, and, and a natural scientist, and so I would never dare get into uh, the uh, social sciences and issues that you're, you're, you're confronting, especially that one, one of the first uh, events I attended where Iraq was discussed from a political science point of view happened at Oxford. Uh, just by chance, I was sitting at the thesis defense of Lula Rashid on, on Iraq. And uh, she actually said flat out that she found no model that explained Iraq. So I'm not going to go there. Uh, but I uh, work for the government, and our business is to come up for our uh, leaders, bosses, call them what you want, with actionable recommendations. And this is what I'm going to end up with. But first, I'd like to give you what, what I call a, a strategic view of the problems that we face in Iraq. And perhaps go uh, uh, and address and drill down to some of the uh, problems or causes of the problems that, of why we are where we are. Uh, the, the main three problems that Iraq has to confront uh, are these. First, it is a country that is still negotiating its transition from dictatorship to democracy. Not an easy thing especially when we're doing a very, very fast pace, and where at the same time there is a change in the governance from a centralized system to a decentralized system. Uh, it, it is really problematic. Uh, you know, it, it offers many, many opportunities, for example, for corruption at the local level, which is one of the things that protesters are complaining about. That's one thing. The second thing that the, that, that the Iraqi government is, is dealing with is a transition from peacetime, from, from wartime to peacetime. That in, in itself is then never an easy thing. And so when you have the two combined, uh, you can imagine the problems that we have. The third element that not a lot of people have been addressing sufficiently in Iraq, I think, um, uh, except recently there was an article in Le Monde Diplomatique by Joan um, Mahmoud on it, which is an incredible youth bulge. I mean, uh, Iraq has had, when I was growing up, Iraq was 7 million people, now we're close to 40. Okay. And, uh, by, by the 2030, that's projections by the uh, by the International Energy Agency, it will be about 50, 60 million. Um, really problematic. Uh, I uh, used to be a member of one of the Global Agenda Councils of the World Economic Forum, which talked, looked at the Middle East, and all they would talk about, uh, you know, inclusive growth to address the youth bulge and finding jobs. And it was basically a talk shop, so I resigned because, like I said. What, what, what is really needed is, is actual recommendations. So how do you address these issues? Well, I mean, no, no country is an island, and you can benefit from uh, examples from other countries. One of the things that we could learn from uh, history is how countries, uh, how countries proceeded and succeeded in their transition from, uh, from wartime to, to peacetime. The country that did this the best is the United States. How did they do it? Well, I mean, and it's really funny because uh, in, in certain cases it wasn't done very well after the you know, First World War and after the uh, Serbian Civil War. Um, and uh, if you recall, uh, when uh, you know, Bremer uh, uh, closed the Iraqi army and, and, and fired all those 300,000, 400,000 uh, soldiers leading to a, two things, a, a uh, militarization of criminality 
and a criminalization of the, of the military. For a few years, we had doctors being kidnapped in Iraq, and they would describe to you military operations. So what did the United States do very well after the Second World War? They initiated two great programs. One is the GI Bill, which took the biggest, most potent fighting machine uh, the world had ever seen until then, and turned it into the biggest engine of economic growth the world had ever seen. Why don't we do something like that? And uh, in terms of actionable recommendations, I look at I mean, American academics, and certainly Iraqi American academics to come up with ideas like this that we could go and, and, and present to, to and you. And you're being Iraqi Americans, I don't understand. Uh, gives you a leg up. Um, imagine what we could do with this. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a plasma physicist. Most of the textbooks that I studied were written by scientists who got their PhDs after returning from the war where they had been uh, radio operators or, uh, or radar operators. I think that the opportunities of this could help you. Um, the second thing they did is that they initiated a number of private sector activities that addressed real problems that Iraq had to deal with, which were, um, which had to do with housing and, and finding employment. And unfortunately, our major industry is not labor intensive. And as we go along in mechanization and computerization, it's going to be less and less labor intensive. Okay. However, there are sectors that are not uh, prone to be uh, uh, mechanized. And certainly, low-cost housing is one of them. And so I, I hark back to the uh, 1940s, when this uh, entrepreneur called Levitt started all these other towns to provide cheap but, afford, but, but, but decent housing to all those returning soldiers that would uh, wanted to have a place to call their own and to start a family and, and so down. And uh, this is something that is critically important for us. We have a shortage of about a million, maybe more, uh, housing units in Iraq. Uh, uh, and uh, a youth that wants to settle down. Iraq is a very, very conservative society. You can imagine what that entails when you are a young kid without any uh, outlet for you to, uh, to live, and, uh, use the work that's Iraq. So ideas like that, ideas that are entrepreneurial class, and by the way, which was decimated by, 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 this, by the uh, nationalizations in 1960 and 70s, but it's beginning to come back again, could use to, uh, well, make money, as in the private sector, but at the same time, offer value to the country and offer services and jobs to the um, The uh, the third uh, element that I that, that we're contending with is the transition to democracy, from dictatorship to democracy. And that is really tricky because Iraq is a, uh, a multicultural, multi-ethnic state. It used to be much more multi-ethnic <coughs> earlier. I mean, uh, those of you that study history know that Iraq at the turn of the last century, uh, most of their major cities, Baghdad, for example, had a plurality of Jews if you split the Muslims between uh, Shia and Sunni. We've lost much of that, but much of it still remains, and I think it's really important for us to maintain it. Unfortunately, we moved very fast into, uh, into uh, identity politics. And I remember complaining to this uh, to Adlan many of the time when they were developing the electoral law. And uh, he said, look, it's normal this would take about four, four electoral cycles, which is what we're seeing. I mean, we are now seeing the emergence of issues politics. That really shows a real maturation of the, uh, of, of the citizen. Why did we uh, arrive to the state we're in? Well, uh, early on, uh, we had no experience in Iraq on elections. And so the United Nations took charge of this uh, very capably. I think the uh, team that was assigned to uh, conduct the elections in Iraq was the team that did the elections in South Africa. And uh, from the outset, their idea was because this is going to be a constitution, a constituent assembly, and where you needed to sort of shovel up the votes that, that are, uh, you know, a mile wide and an inch deep, you needed to put Iraq in a single unit, a single electoral district, and use proportional lists. And that's theoretically good, but there's a difference between theory and practice. 
Um, I mean, I did my PhD in, the in the theory, so I know that very well. Um, you, um, first of all, there was no politics in Iraq before before, before regime change. Call it what you want, 2003. So there weren't, people did not know independent politicians, what people would be willing to uh, run the politics inside. On the other hand, we had a lot of politicians, uh, including Zahra's dad, who's a friend of mine, who went back to Iraq to uh, run for office and to, and because the, uh, electoral system stipulated a list where you would vote and then you would get a uh, number of representatives portion, proportionally to the number of votes you would get. Uh, people in general didn't know who they were voting for. Oh, they, they, people didn't know who they were voting for. And so what happened is that they started voting for the names they recognized. In other words, names of their kin, of their language, of their and that was the root of identity voting in Iraq. Uh, and so that's a problem in itself. But we had an additional problem on top of that, was, which was that the uh, Sunni population in Iraq, in, in Diyala province, in, uh, in Salahuddin, and in Nineveh, were targeted by Al Qaeda and by some people who were hedging their bets still not to vote. So we ended up having a very, very skewed constituent assembly. The Sunnis were extremely underrepresented. The Shia were sort of represented fairly. And I have heard a Kurdish politician, I'm putting the blame on him, who said that, you know, we actually we stuff the ballots pretty nice. Um, so it's a skewed electoral uh, system. And as a result, we uh, uh, there have been attempts. Uh, and, and the reason why the, the, the uh, like I said, the Senior representation was very low, is that they did not participate. I think they had a turnout of less than 20 percent. In the second round of elections, uh, things were improved. Uh, oh, and at the same time, the United Nations set up a very independent uh, and capable um, independent electoral commission that actually had a great role in training all those people who carried out elections in Tunisia and other places. Like that. And the, uh, the result is that we had a, uh, a skewed parliament, parliament where the elector did not necessarily know who they were voting for. Um, and the power was held by the parties. The member of parliament owed his being elected not to the elector, but to the party bosses who put his name high up, sufficient high up on the list. There was an attempt to change that later on, where they reduced the number of, the, the size of the, of the uh, electoral districts by governor, and eventually we had a more even-handed, sort of fair representation of various communities, but still the parties held the upper hand. And then uh, at the next round of elections, they decided the, the, so, well, we're going to change that. We're going to make a system where we will try to give authority to the, to the voter so he, could, he or she could choose the person that uh, represents him. Right? And so we currently have a system where we have uh, uh, ballots which, where we can put down two numbers. One is the list, and two is the number of the candidate on the list. And that's theoretically very nice. You know, but when you have electoral districts that comprise several million people, you end up having a very, very uneven distribution of the votes. You end up having people who have hundreds of thousands of votes, and most people get it right. So again, you have a skewed system. And this is why I'm, I'm raising all of this, because uh, people in Iraq are talking about the reform of the electoral system. And that is really, really critical. And one of the reasons why it hasn't been done so far is that we really don't have a complete census uh, for the country. Um, but there may be a way of going around that. If, for example, if the country were to distribute uh, smart cards with, uh, with geolocation, geo then really come up with very, very accurate uh, electrons and, and conduct uh, elections where everybody who should participate uh, has the opportunity.
So these, these are the things that, that, that need to be done. I, I think the most essential element of the structural reforms that we need to have in Iraq is a reform of the electoral system. Now you know why. Now if you look at the situation that, is, that, is, that, is, that we have in Iraq, I would say it's, it's, a, it's a confrontation between rationality and passion. People are passionate, they, they're fed up, really. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are really fed up. Um, the inequality, the inequalities, the uh, uh, accrued, more recently. And uh, in a sense, perversely, this is the, the, co the cost of the price of success. Until three, four weeks ago, we were talking to people about the fact that in Baghdad, you go to Baghdad, well, you look around, you see all those new restaurants being built, you see all those new car dealerships being built, people out very late. This, this is a consumer society. And so, uh, you know, forces that have, you know, um, generated the anti-Wall Street movement here and the Gilets Jaunes in France, uh, well, played out in Iraq, except with, uh, you know, significant enhancement because of the, of the conditions and because of the, uh, the equity of the situation. And so, to address these issues, the government will have to I'm not speaking now in my own personal capacity to um, uh, follow two tracks. Uh, like One is to address the immediate concerns of the people who are who started the protests. In other words, to find ways to generate jobs. And uh, very slowly, they're, they're getting probably their act together. I noticed that, for example, in the the second round of declarations that the, that the Prime Minister did, that there were uh, programs that would uh, try to propose housing based on distribution and things like that. Um, the second thing is to address the issue that uh, not a lot of people have been addressing sufficiently, uh, but that really makes even people deep in the government burn inside, which is corruption. Because it eats away at the credibility of the, of the state. And it eats away at the efficiency of the state. Because instead of getting competent civil servants, and all the way up to the 1970s before having, before having our, our, our political, our um, civil service completely politicized, we had one of the best civil servants in, in, in the region. Uh, so it it, it hinders your, you, you can't, you can't function as you need to function with, with, with corruption. And so the government has to address this. Uh, and they have started uh, doing that. They, uh, I think uh, the, prime, the president's speech yesterday focused very much on it. But uh, these will have to be measures that, that have teeth uh, in them. Um, here again, I'd like to revert to what what we, we can learn from other countries in terms of, um, of, uh, of addressing these issues. Corruption is a pretty widespread problem, and uh, there is legislation in the United States that bans it. Uh, but there are ways to propose and promote good practices worldwide, and that's through the adoption of standards. Uh, people mostly know of the, of the good excellent management from 9001. I think that, they're, that the, uh, the office that promotes them is based in Geneva. Uh, and the, the other is, is the, uh, I think, uh, 14,001, that's for the environment. And now there is a very promising approach that uh, embraces practices that will sort of crimp the opportunities to have corrupt practices. And that's 30, 37,001. And actually, I'm really proud to say that, you know, so they're raising hand, please. They're investing. We're, we're trying to promote this, to sell the idea, to back that, to see well, if we could institute this. Maybe we could find a way of at least going forward, uh, things would be a little bit better. Um, so these are the things that, I, that I'd like to see people in this country try to propose. Of course, um, there are other things that we, that we could do, for example, to emulate I mentioned earlier examples of, of American action. 
which had to do with the private sector. But nonetheless, the, uh, the, uh, the US government did actually initiate a couple, a couple of programs uh, that were very, very effective uh, at the time of the Depression, for example. The uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, which gave you know, jobs to about a million people in, in the 1930s. And again, uh, uh, something that grew out of the uh, uh, Johnson's social programs, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, which provided skills to, uh, to unskilled workers. Uh, people are thinking about these things in Iraq, in including, and I think it personally would be a good idea, the reinstitution of the uh, compulsory draft, so no two years of military service where uh, young men, most of them men, I think, are not ready to have socially to, uh, to, to, uh, to have those military service, so women fathers in Iraq would, would, would write. Um, uh, and uh, it would be an opportunity, at least, to provide skill sets to people. Um, the other thing that needs to be done, of course, is, is to do a complete accountability of uh, what happened over the last, uh, last uh, three weeks. And so, like I said, the government has to uh, follow up on two tracks. One, measures to address these concerns, corruption, jobs, uh, accountability, but at the same time allow for a uh, uh, process whereby these structural problems uh, that we can be addressed through reform of the electoral law, through uh, a census, or through the establishment of uh, you know, spy ID cards for, for all the uh, uh, Not an easy thing to do. People accused me of being extremely optimistic. <laughs> I have to tell you, I was uh, Iraq's ambassador to France when Mosul was uh, was, uh, was, uh, was taken over. Uh, it's my mother's mo hometown, and so you can imagine what a town like that was. Um, I don't want to downplay what the importance of what's happening. Really, but, uh, I think Iraq has seen a lot worse. And uh, one of my Perhaps with most of the uh, people who deal with Iraq, when they lump Iraq with uh, you know, uh, fragile states, uh, at the risk of being rude, I say, I say that's bullshit. I think Iraq is one of the most resilient countries in the world. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm actually still quite optimistic about the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, just as an Iraqi, I do thank you for being interested in what's going on in the country. It's heartwarming to see support from other Iraqis as well. Um, I tend to get Oscar a lot, so I'm going to just start with some things that occurred to me as we've been having this conversation that I think should be addressed, and then I'll get to the core of the presentation, which for me is actually about the optimistic things that the protests have highlighted for me and for some of my friends in Baghdad and elsewhere in Nara. So the thing that I really wanted to start with, though, that has been inspired just by hearing the ambassador and Zahra talk, is that as diaspora Iraqis, we have a very particular position that we have to be very deliberate about using in an ethical manner. So Iraq, post-2003, was basically led by the diaspora, and the diaspora has failed Iraq. This is the sentiment of Iraqis in the country right now. Uh, this doesn't mean we don't love Iraq as diaspora Iraqis. It doesn't. It's it's not a normative claim about who we are as a, a group. We obviously are nationalistic and we care for Iraq, but I think now, even as academics and who study Iraq and more Iraqi American or Iraqi French, anyways, um, we really have to not be prescriptive in an arrogant sense. We have to actually listen to what people want and be reactionary to their needs. And so I am trying to be deliberate about this in my own research, and I think it's something that a lot of people in the diaspora really need to start paying attention to, because there may have been a vacuum of leadership in Iraq during the Ba'athist era, and the transition may have been very jarring for the country after 2003, and it may have given rise to a lot of people who were qualified to be put in these positions simply because they were outside of the country for a long time, but that doesn't mean that this is a path that we should go down, and that doesn't mean we should be blind to the things that have happened because of these decisions. In some ways, we are removed from the experience of everyday Arab, and we don't live in this toxicity, as Zahra mentioned. I go and live in this toxicity for three months and I come back and I complain and I'm like, I'm so tired. 
what does it mean to live under this for, for basically all of your life, which is what has happened with many Iraqis who are young. It's a very young population. None of them remember Saddam. They have no idea what Saddam was like. They're not expected to remember Saddam. They have the right to demand democracy and freedom and a fair living and dignity. It's not, it's not a lot to ask for when you're 18 and you just want you know, decent education and promise of the future. And uh, this is uh, not as political science-y of me as usual, but it's a very delicate time for Iraq and I really wanted to make this statement. Um, but to the core of my presentation, um, and I will say before I start this, is that I've been having a lot of conversations with Iraqi friends who live in Baghdad and Karbala, where my family is from, and some in Najaf. And a lot of the things that I'm going to say today have arisen from these conversations, so I'd like to give credit to all my friends for helping really put, together, put this together. And I am also optimistic about Iraq's future. I also think Iraq is remarkably resilient as a country. I think we have seen worse, but I don't know if worse is the right word. I mean, this is a protest movement that really screams democracy and people's will. And in a way, it's very empowering to watch. I also think that Iraq history has many examples of protests and revolutions that have been really inspiring. And I, I distinctly remember the thing that has really resonated for me as a scholar is seeing that the first natural Iraqi elections occurred in the city of Kabul in the 1920s. I mean, people actually came together to decide on a leader then. So this isn't really alien to Iraqis. It's not, we're not an exceptional country in the sense that we're having exceptional difficulties or we're like exceptionally bad at dealing with them. Uh, for me, seeing this in a way, it's been, it, it's been sad to see so many people die and suffer, but it's also been very empowering to see that the Iraqi people have a will and will continuously use it. So, um, to that end, I'm just going to start by providing a very basic background of the current protests, October 25th ones, just for those of you who may be unfamiliar with what happened. Uh, my colleagues will be talking about structural reasons in much more detail than me, but I'm just going to give you what it looks like on the ground and what was happening. And Zahra obviously is, the, is a civil society expert, so I'm sure she can answer questions about this later. So um, early October, what happened was the first protests occurred and they were met with a lot of violence, but also with the block of the internet, which really made people very angry. Um, and the reason people were protesting, as many of you know, is because of corruption, because they're very young and have no jobs, uh, and because at this point it feels like there's nothing to lose. Poor governance, poor social services, bad electricity, uh, can't get anywhere without nepotism. It just, in, it's very typical in the sense that a lot of revolutions and protest movements in the world are really attributed to these societal grievances more so than anything. So it's, it's very typical in that sense. Um, one thing that may be thought of as a proximate cause, but I don't want to stay, I don't want to emphasize this too much because people tend to jump to the next conclusion after I say this, is that Lieutenant General Saadi, who is a very important figure in Iraq, uh, for being a loved by all Iraqis, he is. Um, he was responsible for leading the counter-terrorism services, the golden units, as they're called in Iraq. Um, and he was demoted, and people were very angry about it. And he came out publicly and was also um, upset at this devotion, saying that he was a very unifying figure for our Iraqi. So people came out to protest that, too. And I, in a way, it's a very small, proximate cause. Mm -hmm. But it also is very, it's very emblematic of the spirit of Iraq right now, which is very against sectarianism and for national unity. And in that sense, he is one of those figures. So that's, a, a, I would say, one of the proximate causes. The other one is for October 25th, which was actually organized. And so on social media, we, were, we repeatedly saw the protests were going to happen on October 25th. It marks the, the year of Badr Abdel Mahdi, the prime minister's uh, tenure in office. So unlike Americans, will only give 100 days to let their you know, president you know, show what he's done. They gave him a whole year. Um, no, I'm just being facetious here, but uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's just some of the background. So these, the second wave of protests on October 25th, there has not been an internet blockage in the same way. It's been sometimes weaker, harder to access people. Uh, there's been a lot of violence in the sense of uh, tear gas canisters being used in ways that they should not be used to attack people rather than just get yes, as bullets, basically. There's been a lot of violence in the city of Karbala in terms of militias attacking, uh, attacking protesters and getting in conflict with actually some of the members of the Golden Division. So and in a way, it's not very clear who is with the protesters in terms of their rank and file, a lot of the militarized groups, which really speaks to the decentralization that Zahra was talking about. 
So from what I've heard in, in certain areas like uh, Karbala, the golden units were very much still uh, considered important and nationalistic in the eyes of the protesters, and they said they defended us. But some of the some of the paramilitary groups, particularly Iranian-aligned ones, have been have been much more violent, and many people have been killed because of this. And it's in, in one way, this is an unprecedented uprising, just because of how much violence has been employed against peaceful protesters. This is just the basic background of what has been happening in the past few days. Uh, but I wanted to talk about four things that I have found inspiring and optimistic that I have uh, admired in the protesters and what's happening. And like I said previously, this has come from conversations with our Iraqi friends, and I'm trying to be a fair representative to their points of view. So the first thing is that Iraqis are definitely fighting against corruption, but they're also fighting in support of freedom of speech and expression. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is very important because there's been a lot of talk about withdrawal into authoritarianism or dissatisfaction with democracy. And to be frank, I did notice this language of a trade-off between stability and freedom that Iraqis have employed. But despite them saying this, the way that the protests speak to me is that these people are actually very much supportive of their own freedoms and don't want to lose them. And just the attention that has been placed on why did you shut down the internet, why did you attack media offices, has been um, has been inspiring to see in this sense because they do have a vested interest in promoting and protecting their freedom. And freedom is such an essential part of democracy. And so for me, it actually pushes against this rhetoric of withdrawal into authoritarianism. The second point that I think has been raised by a lot of people who have written about this is that this has really been a building of an Iraqi identity in post-2003 Iraq, and I think it's coming into fruition as we watch it right now. This is an anti-sectarian, nationalistic identity built by youth. Iraq is mainly youth, they're very young, and they have been through a lot of sectarian issues in the past, but and I honestly think we dodged a bullet with ISIS because that could have easily been sectarianized. But instead, they pushed back against this. They decided that their identity is Iraqi, and that the way that sectarianism is used is by elites in a way that the, that divides them. And I say this after, and I'm sure that I have this experience with numerous conversations with young Haraqis from all over Iraq, who all speak the same language when it comes to the sense of nationalism. And this is very much like what's going on in Lebanon right now, where people are conceptualizing themselves as the nation against the elite. It's almost populist in a sense. Um, so. Yeah, the people that yeah, the people against the elites and the elites are trying to sectarianize us. Um, that being said, this is a Shia protest in the sense that the Shia population are the ones who have the privilege to protest. Mm. And I say this is someone from Kalbara. So which is the basically one of the Shia hubs in Ara. And the really interesting thing here is that the, the Shia protesters and the Shia Arabis are increasingly recognizing that the reason that Sunni areas are less likely to protest now is because they are going to be unfairly cast as supporters of ISIS or former Baathists or something like that. So this sense of the people versus the elite is really solidifying, even though the technical identity is Shia, and a lot of people are saying, oh, this is a Shia people against a Shia state. No, it's the Shia people as Iraqis against a state that's trying to sectarianize them is the way that they are trying to represent themselves. And this has been a very a point of optimism for me to, to see. Uh, the third thing that I wanted to talk about is that it's been a remarkable breakdown of all the red lines. So the joke in Iraq for years has been about the Khat al-Ahmar, the red line that you can't cross. Don't talk about this person, don't talk about like so many invisible toes in Iraq. Um, and you just never know who you're not supposed to talk about. But I have just been witnessing day after day people just taking down the most terrifying elite figures you can imagine. And I worry for them a bit and then I see it come through and it's, it's, been, it's been amazing to see. Um, here I will particularly say that I am in awe of anyone who has spoken up against Muqtada Sadr and so many have, uh, specifically saying things that don't ride the wave of this protest as if you had tried to do so in the past and we're not letting you do it again. Um, and even more interesting for me as someone who studies religion is the withdrawal of the red line for the clerics. Mm. I mean, year after year, I visit Kabbalah and Najaf, and I study clerics, and I see people who in the beginning will never say, like in 2003 and 4, no one will say a word about anyone who's wearing a turban, you know, definitely a red line, some divine legitimacy there. Year after year, this is withdrawing. This year, I've seen criticism of the Najaya, and I will mention this anecdote because I it came from Kabbalah, and I found it hilarious, but um, maybe this is, 
I have so many cleric friends, so I'm not, <laughs> but I will say the story anyway. From Karbala, I saw someone post something in criticism of the speeches that have come from their religious establishment, and they were making a joke, saying if the Majaya was present at the time of Imam al Hussein going to Karbala, they would say, oh my son Hussein, make sure not to damage any public property. And at the end of the day, the army, uh, the lead army is Muslim after all. And just the irony of this coming from Karbala of all places. I, this isn't really about the people themselves to me. This is about the fact that they shouldn't live in fear. There should be no red lines. And this has been remarkable to see. Um, but related, yeah, related to the to the to the clerics themselves, and I feel like I should I should talk about this, is that there has been very tepid response from the religious establishment. The last uh, sermon was today. And it was interesting in that it actually called out Iran, but not in a direct way for foreign intervention in Iraq. So there really has been mainly, as you would expect from religious leaders all over the world, this is not unique to Iraq. They'll say things like, you know, we support the protesters and their peaceful demands, um, but uh, nothing, nothing that's more dramatic than that is usually done. So this this is why this is a reaction of the people. They're just. They're unsatisfied with the way that the religious establishment is responding, but the religious establishment is part of an elite, and I think they are getting close to the point where they're going to be considered to be definitely in the elite group, and there is no way for them to cross over to the other side. Whether or not they want to be in this position, whether their intention is to be in this position, is a much more complicated issue, but this is just the perspective of, of Iraqis. Related to the religion part, the other thing that I've noticed and that a lot of people are excited about is the taking back of religious symbols from the religious establishment and from the uh, Shia Islamists. And I'm very familiar with the Shia perspective, so I can't speak to if this is happening in other faith groups in Iraq. But for example, just the taking back of the figure of Al-Hussein as a revolutionary and making him like the revolutionary for Iraq, not the revolutionary for like this particular Shia of Iraq, mm -hmm. has been something that's also happening. And it's also happening in Lebanon. Um, and it, the parallels between the two are very, very exciting. Um, one of the final points is that there's a deliberate non-violence that is inspiring despite being met with a lot of violence. And it suggests that despite that these protests aren't planned, they do have a commonality and a theme that people are adhering to, and suggest a, a representativeness and a unity in the, in the protesters. Uh, there is space basically for everyone in Tahrir. There's various points you can go to, um, and they get to more war zone-like uh, at the end, but there really is a space for everyone. There's a space for students, for, for women, for young men, for whoever wants to be part of this. And, um, and there is an acceptance of this is how these protests are going to be. We're going to stick to this theme of nonviolence, and we're going to ask for what we want. Um, all of this being said, I realize uh, there are so many spoilers and so many ways in which this can go wrong. And as a political scientist, I'm all too aware of how revolutions end. So uh, I, I, I don't want to end on a pessimistic note. But I will say that the major spoilers we do have to be concerned about is the thing that every Iraqi politician says, and it's almost a cliche, of having a monopoly on violence is basically impossible in Iraq, and there are too many militias, uh, too many weapons, and too much potential for conflict. So that's something I genuinely am worried about. Um, but because I insist on ending on a positive note, I don't think anything is more democratic than the will of the people being peacefully expressed. And I find it ironic, though unsurprising, that a lot of actors who purport to support democracy in the Middle East are very silent when the spirit of the Iraqi people is really is the spirit of democracy in this sense. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.